so welcome back. What I'd like to do in this part is to give you a little sense of a historical perspective on public health, because it's important to really understand what public health is and what it does. And I want to just start briefly outside of the United States and go back to the 1850s to London, England, when there was a cholera outbreak. And most people at the time thought that you got infectious diseases like cholera from the air, from breathing in. The phenomenon is known as the miasma. And early pioneer in public health by the name of Dr. John Snow didn't believe it. And he became in his activities the founder of modern epidemiology by engaging in the collection of data to try to find out what was actually the cause of the disease. And so if you look at the little map on the other side, what you see is a map of the Soho District of London in 1854. And you see those dots? Those dots are the water pumps in the city where people got their water. And then all those tiny little dots were all the cases of cholera that were identified. And so by engaging in this analysis, he was able to identify that the cause of the outbreak was not breathing in air, it was drinking contaminated water out of the Broad Street water pump. And that created an understanding of what was going on, it enabled public action, and it contributed to the elimination of this public health threat that occurred in 1854. And so, we talk about John Snow to some extent as the founder of modern epidemiology, the founder of modern public health, because lots of people then followed in his example and we admire and respect him today. We have key dates in the history of public health in the United States that are worth mentioning. So in 1850, a Massachusetts citizen by the name of Lemuel Shattuck created what was known as the Sanitary Commission Report that established the blueprint for creating the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, which was the first state health department in the United States. 1910, there was an important report that came out called the Flexner Report, which was the first systematic look at medical education in the United States and found it severely wanting, severely problematic, and so resulted in the closing of most medical schools and the overhaul of medical education. And it also started what is referred to sometimes as the schism between clinical medicine and public health. If you go back to, for example, John Snow, John Snow was a physician. He was a physician, he was seeing patients, but he was also dealing with public health issues. And what we saw after Flexner was a divide between the two parts of healthcare, the healthcare enterprise. 1915, there was an important report funded by the Rockefeller Foundation called the Welch Rose Report, which recommended for the first time specialized education for public health professionals, leading to the creation of what we now know as schools of public health, including ours here, the Harvard School of Public Health. By the way, we saw this schism continue and grow throughout the 20th century, and I recall in the late 1990s, the American Medical Association and the American Public Health Association started a project to try to bridge the chasm between clinical medicine and public health. They called it the Medicine Public Health Collaborative. They did a lot of good activities for a few years, and then it petered out, and the schism kind of continues, although it's, it's changing and shifting. I mentioned the 1988 Institute of Medicine report that talked about the serious deficiencies in public health around the United States. And then I'll talk more about this near the end, but in the 2000s, in this new century, we're seeing a renovation and a renaissance in public health. We're seeing the growth of a new research enterprise called Public Health Services and Systems Research. We're seeing a public health accreditation movement growing interest in population health, health and all policies. Stay tuned, I'm gonna tell you more about all of these three. But here's something I'd really like to show you. These are identified by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as the 10 top public health achievements of the 20th century. 
And I'd like to show you just briefly a little bit about each one of these so you have some sense what does public health actually accomplish and do? Why does it matter for me? So the first one is immunizations and vaccinations. If you can look at these two tables in front of you, what you can see is early in the century and in our new century, about 100 years later, the extraordinary drop in cases of different kinds of childhood diseases, smallpox, polio, other kinds of viruses have either been eliminated like polio or significantly diminished and that is because of immunizations and vaccinations and deaths have plummeted as you can see in the table. That's a victory of public health. That's what public health is about. Here's another one, motor vehicle safety. So we are driving so much more. People drive six to 10 times more miles per year than they did a hundred years ago. And yet the death rate from driving has plummeted over the course of that hundred years. Why is that? Why is that? Because of public health interventions like seat belts, child safety seats, making the glass of a sort that it doesn't blow apart in a collision. All of these kinds of things have had dramatic impacts in terms of making driving a car less life-threatening to you than it was 80 or 100 years ago. And so that's a key victory of public health. Here's another one, workplace safety. Over many years, going back over 100 years, workers in the United States faced incredibly high health and safety risks on the job. They'd get injured, they would catch diseases from the kinds of substances and materials they were working on. And you can see from this, this is just between the early 1980s and the late 1990s, the drops in terms of improved safety uh, and the drop in death rates for mining, agriculture, construction, transportation. A lot of this is a federal agency, part of the Department of Labor called the Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA. And we think of them as a labor organization, a workplace safety organization. They do public health. They do public health and it makes a difference. They get a lot of criticism and part of the challenge in terms of doing public health is making the decisions and the choices. What do we focus on versus what do we not focus on? Because there are always many, many more things you could focus on and how do you make those decisions? And sometimes it's done right and sometimes it's done poorly. It's all part of public health. Here's another one. Control of infectious diseases has declined dramatically over the course of the 20th century. You can see from this map the crude death rates from infectious diseases. And go back to 1900, look how high it is. You see that spike around 1920? That was the great influenza that killed about 20 million Americans as well as countless millions more around the world. But the trend has been a drastic drop in terms of the impact of infectious disease. And it's because of public health interventions to make our environment safer and healthier for us. Here's a very big one. Heart disease has been the leading cause of death in the United States since 1921. And stroke has been the third leading cause since 1938. And what you can see in this chart is the dramatic declines in heart disease and stroke that we have been able to accomplish through a host of kinds of interventions. One of the biggest, of course, is the amazing drop in tobacco use and smoking. But there are others. Better medical care in terms of emergency treatment, defibrillators, all different kinds of things that all are part of the public health enterprise working closely with the clinical community. Here's another one, safe and healthier foods. So, you know, in the early 20th century, it was much more likely that from the food you ate, from the milk you drank, from the water you drank, that you could get a very serious foodborne infection. What are they? Typhoid fever, tuberculosis, botulism, scarlet fever, things we don't hear about anymore. We don't hear about them anymore because we, for the most part, created a safer, healthier food system so that people are far less likely to get sick from any of these things. And you can see from this chart, this is typhoid fever. You know, who talks about or even thinks about typhoid fever? 
it's, uh, it, it's mostly disappeared here in the United States. And it's a victory of public health and the kinds of approaches that we do that have enabled that to happen. Here's another one. Healthier mothers and babies. We've had a 90% drop in infant mortality going back over 100 years. Here's an even more startling statistic. We've had a 99% drop in maternal mortality for a lot of different reasons and interventions. Some of these are clinical. Many of these are what we sometimes refer to as clinical epidemiology, so that we take public health approaches and apply them to creating safer outcomes for mothers and babies in the childhood experience. One of them is something that you've probably heard of called the APGAR score, which is a simple checklist, which you heard about from Atul Gawande before this, that provides a simple way to measure right when the baby comes out whether there are any problems and it becomes standard. That's a public health approach. That's what Atul Gawande was talking about, applying public health approaches to clinical care. Here's another one, family planning. We don't necessarily think about that too much, but that is an important part of creating a healthier society because the truth is smaller families and longer intervals between births contribute to the better health of children, better health of their mothers, and uh, better social and economic status for women. And so family planning has been the tool and the way that we've achieved this. Okay? Fluoridation of drinking water. So we've had a major decline in cavities, or what's known as dental caries, which is a disease. And we have significantly achieved that since the discovery of water fluoridation in the 1940s. This is still controversial. There are a lot of folks out there who get very upset and angry about fluoridating the drinking water supply, but it has had a dramatic impact in terms of improving oral health for the entire population. Then the last one I want to mention is just tobacco. Tobacco is a health hazard, and you can see starting 100 years ago, we were in a much better shape because so few people actually smoked cigarettes. And over the 20th century, we saw an explosion peaking in the 1960s, around the time that the U.S. Surgeon General released a landmark report in 1965 on smoking and health that really started and launched and kicked off in a serious way the national anti-smoking movement that has now resulted in a significant drop in tobacco consumption. We're seeing this now across all developed countries. All developed countries around the world are seeing declines in smoking. And unfortunately, as smoking declines in the developed countries, it's increasing at an even faster rate than the declines increasing at a faster rate in the underdeveloped countries. But this has been a significant major public health achievement. By the way, these are the CDC's top 10. If I were doing the top 10, I might throw a few other things in here as well. I would throw, for example, lead in the environment as a huge public health achievement. We have seen dramatic drops in the average level of blood, which has a direct impact on a child's IQ because of eliminating lead in paint, eliminating lead in gasoline, eliminating lead in cans, the soldering of cans, major public health. So these are the CDC's top 10, and I think they give you a good sense of what public health tries to do, what it's focused on, and how it does its work. So more to come.